Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining this session um, in which I'll, I'll explain uh, to you guys what it is that uh, you risk as a customer with a, with a broker. Uh, my name is uh, Juan. As you know, I'm CEO with DarwinX, which is a broker. So it's actually my job to understand the, the risks that uh, we face as such. And I would be delighted to take any questions from you as we go through the presentation, which is initially quite simple but then there's a few more technical issues towards the end. So by all means, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if you have any questions, go ahead and I'll try to take them as and when I, I can without interrupting the flow of the presentation. So here we go. Uh, as you know, uh, brokers do go down every once in a while. Uh, you know, there was a, a big, big shakeup during the, in the middle of January when uh, a big spike in the Swiss rank took down a whole bunch of brokers. We'll see today exactly why, because I've seen quite a bit of uh, bad explanations uh, about it floating around. Uh, but my core message to you today is that you, should, that you have no reason to panic because uh, you do control uh, a lot more than you realize in making sure that uh, you know, sending money to a broker and never seeing it again does not happen to you. Uh, unless, of course, you do ignore the four risks that you're incurring when you pick a broker. Uh, the first of which is uh, a management risk. Ultimately, a broker is a, is a legal entity behind the, which there's people, and those people can either be uh, rotten apples, of which there's quite a few, or they can be just plain incompetent, uh, in which case, uh, even if the guys mean well, it could be that they end up losing a ton of money, including yours. So that's the first risk you run. Then, <clears throat> depending on the type of broker you trade with, uh, there is some market risk. What happens if the market moves in a way such as, the, as it did, for instance, on the 15th of January? Uh, there can be liquidity risk. Uh, there are times, and this is the, one of the surprises that a lot of people don't appreciate about the, the foreign exchange market. The foreign exchange market exists for as long as people are willing to trade. And there are times uh, when everybody is so scared, including banks, when the market just uh, disappears and uh, dries up. There's just no way to trade anything because no one else is willing to take the other side of trades. That's a liquidity risk. And the last risk is a counterparty risk, uh, in which, which affects uh, both brokers and you uh, to the degree that someone trading with your broker, be it a liquidity provider or another customer just like you, uh, implodes and uh, some money is lost. So we'll, we'll see that one too. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the goal of today is to cover all of those and, uh, more importantly, to teach you how to mitigate them to make sure that uh, your money is safe at all times. So how does a broker's balance sheet look like? It's very simple. On the uh, asset side, you have a brokerage account, so a broker account, so like some money that is deposited somewhere with a bank. And then uh, backing that, there is uh, some broker capital and, uh, and some money that the broker owes to, some, uh, to, to its creditors. And then on top of that, this is where you come in. So when you deposit money, that money becomes a liability that your broker owes you. And that money, if it's a regulated broker, will be put in a segregated uh, client trust or a separate account so that, and this is very important, the broker's money, which is in the broker account, and the client's money, which is in the client trust, never get in touch with each other except when there's a legitimate reason for it, as we shall see a bit down the line. So that's where your money is, and very importantly, uh, and more importantly, it's actually where your money is not. Your money is, once your money has left your account, you lose control over it, and then hopefully nothing happens, but more things can happen if it's sitting in somebody else's account, your broker's account, than can if they're sitting in your own account, as is just very, very obvious. Which has a risk of it. Of course, the, the money is an account and the broker controls both of those accounts. So if the, the persons behind that broker are a rotten apple, then uh, nothing or very little things stop them from actually taking the money and, uh, and running. And uh, if you do a few searches for scams and uh, Ponzi schemes and so on, you'll see that there's a, a ton of, uh, of these examples over history where somebody has just taken the money and run, just like, you know, uh, 
Madoff scale would be quite big. But then there were only this week, there's been a few examples of uh, a few uh, brokers in, in dodgy places that just disappeared and uh, with the customer money. So this is the one that you always want to avoid, of course. Uh, because at that point, the, the assets are gone and uh, all that's left is a liability that no one's ever going to pay, pay back to you. So how do you avoid that? Well, first of all, uh, you can do some due diligence. So you can try to find out who are the people behind that broker. You just look it up on, on, uh, on Google, try to find the persons that run the broker, the names of the CEO and so on. You can then go to LinkedIn and make form your own opinion as to whether you think that person is qualified to run a brokerage. Uh, you would do well to get in touch with customer support, et cetera, et cetera, to just see if everybody is responding the way that you would expect it. And all of this, of course, before you, you wire a single euro or pound to, to those guys, because uh, after that, the money is at risk. Ultimately, though, the best thing you can do is seek an independent quality third party, such as a regulator, for instance, in the case of Darwin X, it's the Financial Conduct Authority in the, in the UK that will have, has a process to grant a permission to run a broker that gives you the reassurance that the FCA has done all of this before you, uh, you try to go to the broker. So, you know, ultimately, what is the best thing you can get is you, you can't do better than than trading with a regulated broker, but then again, doing some due diligence by yourself never hurts, as, I, as I'm saying here. Uh, and that actually is a good thing, because um, you know, uh, a, a regulated broker will, will be run by people who have nothing to hide, uh, no skeletons in the closet, precisely because the moment that you try to get approval uh, to offer a broker, you know that the, the regulator is going to verify the, both the competence, are the, you know, do you know what you're doing, and your integrity before they give you a brokerage license. If you re uh, read that on fit and proper, you will see that the, uh, this is one of the core criteria that the Financial Conduct Authority uses before they allow someone to be FCA regulated. Uh, and then you should know that, for instance, in, in my case, I am the uh, compliance function two of Darwin X uh, in my capacity as director and CEO. And I know fully well that if I run away with uh, some money, several things will happen. The first thing of which will be that I will never be able to work in the financial sector again, at least not in a regulated capacity. Uh, I would stand uh, for criminal charges, depending on what it is that I had done. So you can imagine that uh, the incentives, other than you know, not wanting to be a bad person, are pretty strong not to do anything stupid or downright illegal as an, a regulated broker. None of which, uh, and, and that acts as a very strong deterrent. So if a broker is not regulated, it's either because the guys are, uh, are trying to hide something or because the guys try to be regulated and they were not deemed fit and proper. So it's a very, very strong warning signal to stay away from a broker that is regulated or registered in uh, New Zealand and all these things. Furthermore, uh, as a customer with a regulated broker, um, you, you should know that the regulators seek to promote trust. So, for instance, in the, in the United Kingdom, there's a, 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 regu um, um, a governmental body called the Financial Services Compensation Scheme, which guarantees the first £50,000 invested by any one customer with any one FCA regulated broker, which means uh, even if the broker goes down, then you are sure that the United Kingdom government ultimately will step in and make good on the first £50,000 invested with, uh, with the broker. Now, obviously, the, the UK government does not like to lose money, so they are the ones who impose the obligation to segregate accounts, as I was saying. So, for instance, uh, for an FCA regulated broker like that, Winex, it's impossible to. Um, well, it's, it is possible, but it's highly penalized to basically take money out of the client account to put it into the broker account unless it, it's justified on the basis of charging commissions from, from customers. So at all times, both accounts must be separate. And at all times, uh, we are forced every day to cross-check that the amount of money that we owe customers and that the amount of money that is held in the client trust stack up and if there is a shortfall we have to do two things we have to fill 
split from our own capital. And second thing, we have to get on the phone to the FCA immediately to report that we have had a serious issue in that situation. And this happens on a daily basis. Furthermore, in the case of a uh, broker going down, for instance, in the case of Alpari in, in the UK going down, what happens is, is that the customer deposits enjoy priority vis-a-vis -vis shareholders of the broker, as you can see in red, and other creditors of the broker, so that whatever assets are in either account or buildings or whatever, go first to repaying the customers and the FSCS, and last to the creditors and the broker capital. So you enjoy preference in the case of default, which means that uh, worst case, uh, if a regulated broker, for instance, by the Financial Conduct Authority goes down, it really is a question of time before you get your first £50,000 back. So there is a risk, of course, and it is painful because uh, I think the Alpac went down on, on uh, January the 15th, 2015, and the customers are getting their monies back now. So it's taken like a good three months before uh, your money was back to, your, to, to, the, to their owners, but it has come back, which is a big reassurance, obviously. Oh, so there's a customer who says he's still waiting. So uh, apologies for that. I uh, I know of a few customers of, of that who claim that the money is on their way, but I have no way to verify that. So I'm I'm really sorry, and I feel for you, John, if that's if if that's the case. Ultimately, though, you should know that uh, you have a very strong claim, and the money will come. So uh, th there's a, a few questions that have come up in the Spanish version that I did of this webinar last week. The first one is uh, if if uh, monies are covered in different currencies, and the answer is yes. It's Fifty thousand pounds, or the, uh, the 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 sterling equivalent, that is guaranteed, and also uh, the extent that they are below fifty thousand. So, for instance, if you had opened an account with twenty thousand, and you have traded your way up to fifty thousand, then uh, the the guarantee is still good for the profits. So you would get the fifty thousand, not the twenty thousand. Okay. So ultimately, what is the best you can do? Well, the best you can do, John, I, I'm really sorry that you, you lost that, you know, you're still waiting for your money, but ultimately, uh, it's, it's really a question of timing, and you know that you will get it back. There's a, I think there was a broker that went down this week in New Zealand, and those guys, they're never going to see a single pound back. So uh, it's a bad situation, but it's a much better one to be in than uh, the, the guys who trusted New Zealand. And ultimately, you can't do any, any more than you did, because, I mean, who would have known that? Uh, you can look it up. So there's a question: Which broker in New Zealand? Uh, there was a new. There's some news in by Leapfrog this week uh, reporting that. I we can take that offline if you if you want. Uh, Exploit you. I'll I'll let you know. Okay. So, but you must be wondering. So this guy signed up to give a webinar for 45 minutes, and we're 15 minutes into the webinar, and uh, I, I probably haven't really told you anything that you didn't let know. So uh, if you're interested into the nuts and bolts of the actual risks that the broker is running, uh, that's what the, the rest of this webinar is about. Uh, so I'd like to explain to you um, how it is that FXCM almost went down on the 15th of January and what could have possibly uh, taken down Alpari, although I don't know firsthand, obviously. So I'm, I'm talking out of what I've seen from the press and I'm not an insider to any of, of these. So. Uh, we're going to, for the rest of the webinar, we're going to work through uh, the list of four risks that I discussed, and we're, we're, going to work the, uh, we're going to work them off in a sequence, differentiating by whether the broker is a, uh, well, it's, it's a dealer, a market maker, as you, as you know them, or it's a pure broker uh, that, um, that, uh, that offered the, the services. And as you'll see, the different types of brokers suffer different types of risks, okay? So we'll get going with the risks faced by a market maker, a, a dealer, so-called. And uh, this is the more complex part of the presentation, so feel free to interrupt, and I'll do my very best to, to explain the bits that, that come through. Okay? So first of all, what happened on the 15th of, of January? Just a little reminder. Well, basically, the Swiss franc had been held in, uh, had been pegged to the euro in a, uh, in, oops, in a range uh, that uh, that was uh, capped at the 120 to the to the euro, and uh, all of a sudden, without any previous notice, uh, the the Schweizer National Bank uh, let go of the peg, 
And there was a big sp jump in price from 120 all the way uh, up to 1.02. Now, the crucial bit, and this is going to come back to us through this webinar, is the fact that you see a straight line connecting the 120 and the 102, but actually in that, on that account, this, um, this thing is wrong because the, um, the, there was no jump. The, there was a, the last price that happened was 120, and uh, within 10 minutes, it was down to 1.02, and there was no way to trade any prices in between. And that makes a big, big difference in the risk that brokers face. So let's get going with it. Okay, and we'll start with the dealer. Uh, what defines a market maker? Well, a market maker, if it's a pure market maker, always takes the other side of the customer trades. And you can think of it as always trading against customers. Okay, so what is the risk uh, that, uh, say, a market maker faced in this situation against clients along the Swiss rank? Well, what would have happened is <clears throat> that the customers would have made a ton of money. Any customer along the Swiss rank would have made a ton of money, which essentially meant that the money that was in the brokerage account had to be transferred to the client account. So the clients were the winners here, and the brokers took a hit in the capital base that you can see here. So the, broker, uh, the, the, the shareholders of the broker paid uh, money as, as a deposit for the customers to back the wins that the customers had made. So uh, in, in this situation, a dealer faces a market risk. The, the dealer's um, financial health depends on what the market does and what his customers are doing. There is a market risk, uh, which is, as we'll see, does not affect a pure broker. Now, uh, some other people might ask, uh, okay, so what happened with the customers who were on on the right side of the trade who were short the euro in this situation. Well, those guys would have thought that they had made a killing until an inbox, you know, something reached their inbox, which would have been the, the, this message that uh, Saxo Bank, for instance, sent to the customers, where essentially they said, hey, you know, we've been filling your positions and you do have a paper profit, but, you know, yeah, so we'll come back to, to FXCM in a second. Uh, uh, just hang on a bit longer, Mr. C, and I'll, I'll get on to that. But FXCM, at this point, you should think of as a broker, not a market maker, because they were trading with customers, not against customers. So we'll get on to that in a second. Okay, so Saxo Bank, as a market maker, or at least a partially market making, did trade against customers. And what they did is, seeing as they, as they probably saw, that they had lost a bundle on customers who were... Uh, along the Swiss rank, then they basically decided not to make good on their promises and just kind of took the money back. <laughs> that's pretty much what they did. You can call it many fancy names, but that's what it was. And that's the kind of the main issue that you face as a retail customer who's trading a big, uh, br uh, big dealer much bigger than you. Uh, the, the, the problem is, of course, that the, the dealers are uh, both the a player, they're playing against you, but at the same time, they are the referee in the game and it's very very hard I and mean, it's pretty hard to beat the market but it's uh, seriously hard if you're also having to to kind of having take hits like the ones the, these guys took where all of a sudden um uh, yeah you know you had a profit which was just taken away from you so uh there's a question about whether there's protection in the united states of america i i don't know the specific details i don't have them handy right now but uh, yes there is there's a very specific uh, regulation against uh, with forex brokers in the US and they have to start they have to have a, a strong capital base bring out forex business well we'll we'll get onto some of that a bit later um, we also mentioned so we've covered counterpart we've covered the market risk so dealers have market risk we have covered the liquidity risk that we just discussed which they don't really have because they're free to basically just invent whatever prices they want which is the factor what Saxo Bank did in that situation and now we're looking at counterparty risk so do um, do the, the, the dealers have a counterparty risk against customers well actually they don't what happens in this situation is that uh, if a customer was uh, short, that was wrong, on the wrong side of the trade, the customer could not lose more than their initial deposit because all that happens is that all the monies in the client accounts go into the broker account and that's it. So the customer has lost everything and the broker has not lost a single penny, 
which means a pure dealer has no counterparty risk. They don't need to be worried about it. And that's, crucially, that's one of the reasons why dealers did much better than, so market makers survived the 15th of January much better than your average broker did, which was a surprising insight. So a lot of people thought that uh, it, was, uh, it was the dealers that had gone bust, but actually it wasn't the dealers, it was the brokers that did on that day. And I would like to explain to you now why. So this is, you know, what happens after the customers have lost everything? Well, what happens is that, you know, the customer money is gone, all their monies are in the broker account, the broker capital has grown by a tiny bit, and then, of course, the broker, the, the dealer has no customers, but that's, that's, all, that's where it all ends. Uh, there's no there's no counterparty risk. They don't they're not owed any money by by customers. So that's the summary for the dealer. Does anyone have questions on how you know what the risks are that our market maker faces? This is kind of the, the straightforward part of it, really. Okay, well, it looks like we're good. So let's uh, get on with the fun part now, and we're going to discuss. Uh, for instance, what took down FXCM? So uh, you can think of me explaining now what, what it is that took FXCM down on the, on the Swiss franc crisis. Uh, first, you know, there's a question that I get a lot, uh, and it's people asking me, how can I tell whether a broker really is a broker and not a market maker? Well, so for that, if the, so you can go, for instance, to the homepage, the, the, the right way to go about it is to go to the homepage of the broker, in this case, for instance, uh, the broker that I run, which is DarwinX, and then uh, the, the footer of the page, sorry, I just logged into my account, I'll log right out. At the footer of the page, there's a, there's uh, some, some legal, legal wording that the FCA imposes on brokers saying that we are uh, authorized and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, as you can see here, crucially with FR, FRN financial reference number 586466. So let's copy that number and then you search for the FCA register. So we go in there. We're going to be searching for companies. So search the financial services register. We're looking for a financial services firm. And the way to find the firm is to use the firm reference number, the FRN, which as you saw a second ago for uh, Darwin X, uh, is 586466. So we look for it here. And then you would have to go to the permission section and look for the activity of dealing in investments as principal. This is how the regulators call, uh, call running a brokerage, as you can think of. And the way to know if a broker is a broker that trades that only trades with customers or it's a dealer that can trade against customers is by looking at this permission here. So. Uh, for instance, Darwin X has a limitation to be a matched principal broker, which means whenever you are long the euro dollar against the market, it is by being uh, you trade against Darwin X, so you go long the euro dollar and Darwin X goes short the euro dollar, just like a market maker would. But then we have the match principal obligation that forces us to at the same time in, enter into a trade long the euro dollar against the market, which means that uh, you are long the euro dollar and we are long the euro dollar with you. So we are de facto trading with you and whatever happens to your monies happens to us, as we'll see in a second. But more importantly, the only way to know whether a broker really is a broker and not a market maker in disguise is to go to the regulatory page and check whether this restriction is there. If the restriction is there, then you can be 100% sure that uh, the, the, the brokerage is actually a broker. If you don't see it there, then you can safely assume that it's a, the, the, the so-called broker is actually not a broker, but at least a market, uh, partially a market maker, 
because it's a lot more expensive in terms of capital to be a market maker than it is to be a broker. So, you know, why would you um, seek to pay to be uh, a market maker if you're not going to use that capital? So this is the way that you can tell whether a broker really is a broker. Don't pay attention to the ECN, 100% STP, and blah, 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 crap. All you need to do is go to a separate page and figure out whether the broker has this limitation. If it doesn't have it, it's not a broker, it's a dealer. Okay? So let's go back to that. and see how it is that a broker uh, operates. Well, in this situation, we have a, a three-tiered setup in which on the right-hand side, you would be here. So for instance, you're, uh, in, in this situation, the guys who, who were, say, long the Swiss franc, you basically uh, borrow some euros. When, you, when you're trading the, the, the Swiss franc euro, you're borrowing some euros to buy some Swiss franc, and you put down some equity with your broker. And this equity is actually the customer deposit that's deposited with your, the liability that your broker owes you. So this is the broker balance sheet. And then the broker has a set of liquidity providers and enters exactly the same trade that you entered. So the, the market is the opposite of your side, the, the opposite of your trade, but your broker is taking the same trade as you at all times, if it is a broker. And this is the core difference because that's the exact opposite situation of a dealer. Now, what is the benefit here? So for instance, uh, winning customers who, who were uh, long the Swiss franc and short the Euro, well, you can see here, the, their assets went up in value. So the Swiss franc was worth more and what they owed was worth less. Therefore, the trader's equity went up. That's why it's green. So they had a profit. Now, what happened to a broker in this situation? Well, what happened to the, to the broker is that the same profit that the customer was making against the broker, the broker was making against the liquidity provider, which de facto meant that the liquidity provider owed the same money to the broker, the same change in money to the broker, that the broker owed to his customers. So what's the risk here? Well, the risk is, of course, that the liquidity provider goes bust, cannot honor the profits, and therefore there's an issue here, uh, which we'll get onto in a, in a second. So the more, the more important bit, though, is that whether you are winning or losing in this setup is neither here nor there for the broker because uh, it's fully insulated. Whatever you're making, we're making, or whatever you're losing um, is, is covered from, from the other side. So there's no market risk for a broker. Is that clear? Because this is the, possibly the most complex slide today. Okay, uh, I hope no news is good news, <laughs> uh, but I, I think it should be clear. So a, a broker is doing the same thing as you, so uh, they're not affected by whether you win or you lose uh, directly. Of course, brokers want you to be in, win long term because, of course, you pay a commission on the volume you trade, and the more the more it is in your account, the more you can trade, and it's good long term. But the short term, we don't really care. But there is a liquidity risk on the counterparty side, and this is one part of the things that took down some of the brokers. So what happened was that, in theory, uh, you you were not you did not have a market risk, but uh, you, when you when the the broker wanted to take his money from his prime broker, the money wasn't there, so he had made a loss. But the money was owed to his customers, so he you know he was uh, kind of crunched in between the two situations. So how did um, so somebody asked me before? How did FXCM go down? Well, the core of the loss that FXCM had was losing customers, uh, and this is how it how it happened. And the the customers who were short the franc were in the opposite side of the trade. So they say owed euros, and uh, so they they owned uh, euros and owed Swiss franc, which went against them. So their equity was diminishing. The broker had diminishing customer deposits, but also had diminishing client trust. So in theory, nothing would have happened. But of course, uh, and that's because traders stay in the traders as long as there's a margin in the customer account. Now, what happens when the customer has lost it all? Well, when the customer has lost everything, a broker has a stop loss in his, um, in his prime broker, brokerage account 
to exit the trades. So for instance, you know, depends on the margin the customer had down, but in normal market situation, whenever the market reached 1.18, say, then there would be no equity left in the customer account. And at that situation, the broker would have exited the trade against, say, Goldman Sachs. And in that situation, that all that would have happened would have been that the, the customer would have lost a ton, the broker would have lost a ton in that trade, but it would have kept the deposit by the customer, and that's about it. There would, there would have been no further risk. However, the issue was, as I mentioned before, is that there was no market at 118. What happened was that, and actually I apologize because this is in Spain, what happened was that the, the, the market went straight down from 120 to 102 with nothing in between, which basically meant that the broker was dragged along in the losing, losing trade. Uh, so the customer had lost more than their initial deposit. Say, you know, some customers had put down, say, 2,000 and they lost the, two, the 2,000. But then they, they continued in the trades until they had lost a, another, say, 18,000 for which they had not put down any margin. In that situation, of course, it's very, very hard for the broker to go sue their customers for them to send good money after bad money. So what happens there is that the capital base of FXCM in this case was just gone. Okay, so basically FXCM didn't lose anything per se, but FXCM's customers did lose it. And in that setup, the FXCM was the one that had to pay the liquidity providers for the, the loss in the trade for which they, they were acting as a counterparty. And this is what took FXCM down and uh, part of the reason why um, Alpari went down. Okay, so the main issue was liquidity risk. The situation is uh, this would have never happened if there, hasn't be, there hadn't been a jump in the, in the Swiss franc the way it, it did. So the, the last time there had been a jump like that was in 1992 when Sterling left the European monetary uh, system. But uh, it, you know, it took like, this is, this is a one in 25 year event. And uh, when that happens, brokers are potentially in trouble. And it's even worse so because they are, they're hit by a double whammy. So it could be that, uh, so for instance, say if half your customer base as a broker is making money out of this trade, but then your liquidity providers are not able to honor those profits, then you are hit as a broker. And then in addition, if the other half of your customer base is losing money and they lose more than they had deposited in, in, uh, in margin, then you're hit by a double whammy. So you're, you've, you've got counterparty risk with your liquidity providers and you have counterparty risk with the customers. And since you are owed, you're forced to pay back to everybody what, what they owe you, you kind of, uh, you, you have to, you can't compensate whatever profits you've made against whatever losses you've had, which is, makes it double, double worse. Okay. So that's what took um, FXCM down. And this closes the circle. So if you look at the, the overview of risks, um, we, you know, in, whether you're trading with a dealer or a broker, you definitely have to make sure that they are legitimate. The best way to do so is to check whether they're actually regulated. Uh, that's about as good as you can do with the information that, that's uh, at hand. And then you should know that a dealer has market risk, but it doesn't have liquidity risk. So the a dealer doesn't care a hoot if the market has moved uh, 118 from 120 to 102 because they're actually not in the market. All they are is just a casino. And in terms of counterparty, uh, and this was a very, very hypocritical position for someone to be taking, such as, for instance, Oanda. Oanda said, oh, we're going to be very nice and we will not go against customers who owe us money, which is completely bollocks, because, of course, the customers didn't owe them any money in that situation. The customers lost the margin and that was it. There was no, that Oanda did not suffer any loss beyond the, because they, the fact that they did have the stop loss to get out of the trade. So when it comes to brokers, again, you know, ditto for the uh, management risk, then brokers, in theory, as long as there's a market, don't give a hoot if customers are winning or losing because they're insulated against it. But if there is, they do have a liquidity risk in the sense that if there is no market, then the stop losses don't work. And furthermore, because the stop losses don't work, then they are caught between the devil and the blue sea. They can have counterparty risk both with customers who lost more than their initial deposit 
and with liquidity providers who cannot honor the profits that the, the broker had in their prime brokerage account. Okay? So, you know, that's, uh, that's about it. Uh, now, if you're thinking that trading with a broker is a bad idea and that this was bound to happen uh, by, by definition, well, hold your horses because that, you know, what took down FXCM was like the, the proxy was, as I said, it's losses owed by customers, but they would have never happened, ha had those losses if they had incentivized customers to trade for the long term. Why? Well, if customers were trading with one-to-one -one leverage, Right, so there's a question here which is saying that there's a question asking whether Oanda stops work. So let's, let's recap, okay? Let's recap, go back to what happens to a dealer in this situation. In, 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 the, in the case of a dealer, the stop of the dealer was to say, well, you know, I'll continue to have the, I'll continue to keep the customers in the trade until the point when the money is lost. Okay, so it's a, a market maker or a dealer uh, like like a, like Oanda uh, is it, really is really like you know it, it's a, it's a two sided bet. You know, uh, we're gonna bet one hundred euros that I win and you lose. Uh, of course, if everybody if if everybody has put down fifty bucks um, initially, the moment that the bet is won, then the hundred euros are there, and that's about it. There's no way that you can lose more than you had put down initially. So the moment that the, all the, the the customer deposits, so if if a customer had put down two thousand euros and the two thousand euros were gone, all that happened was that Oanda transferred some money from their client account to the Oanda account, but that's it. Oanda did not owe anything to anyone else. So this is the stop, the, the stop loss of Oanda is just that. It's like, you know, whenever the, the customer money is gone, uh, period, game over. The, 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 I, I don't owe any, money, any, any more money to the customer. All the customer's money is mine. I keep it, and that's it. And that's how, that's how a market maker makes money. You put down 3,000 euros, the market maker knows that you will end up losing them because most people trade like headless chickens. And what happens in the, in the process, it's a slow bleeding whereby the 3,000 euros that used to belong to the customer, so there would be the money in the client trust account, over time gradually move to the broker account with every losing trade plus the spread. So this is where the, the Oanda stop uh, worked, that because Oanda is, at least it's not fully a broker. If, if, I don't know if, if Oanda only trades against customers or is also a broker. Now contrast that with the situation facing FXCM. So let's go for that. Let, let's replay that one. <clears throat> In this situation, the customer had put down 2,000 euros, which are the 2,000 euros on the right-hand side. And the FXCM was trading with customers against, say, Goldman Sachs. So in this situation, the customer has lost 2,000 euros against um, FXCM, and FXCM has lost 2,000 euros against Goldman Sachs. So up to this point, uh, FXCM has not lost any money. What happens next? Well, what happens next is that the 2,000 euros are gone, so there's no more equity in the customer account, and FXCM wanted to shut down the trade uh, in which were, they were on the losing side. So let's say at 118, FXCM would have normally exited the trade because the customer was gone. So the customer was no longer in the trade. His money was gone. There was no margin. But the problem then was that there was no market at FXCM. And the next, the next price at which uh, FXCM could close the losing trade was 1.02. So they were dragged along for all the loss, all the, all the ride from say 118 to 102. But because Oanda was not doing this in the first place, because Oanda traded against customers and not with customers, that didn't happen to them. They didn't need a stop in the first place. Did that explain it, MRC?
Okay, so that, that's basically the, the, the core difference. It's a, if you're trading against the casino, the casino just keeps your money, and that, that's where the game is over. The problem here is that you can think of the market as the casino. So basically, when you trade with a broker, the broker is the, is the agent that takes you to the casino. And in that situation, when the customer's money is gone, then the agent is screwed alongside. That's what took them down. Uh, then I've got a question as to whether Oanda runs tops. To the best of my knowledge, uh, I, I think Oanda enjoys a pretty solid reputation. So being a market maker per se doesn't make you uh, a bucket shop. And to the best of my knowledge, Oanda does not run stops, and certainly they are regulated in the U.S. So uh, they, I, I, don't, I very much doubt they run stops. Um, but I, I don't really know. I, you know that, that's a question for Oanda's CEO, not Darwin Exis. So, yeah, well, this is the, the point. So this is a very important point that FX Poiki is asking. So he's saying, if prices go over stops, what happens to the stops? Are they honored? And the question is, let me put it this way. Uh, you can buy an, an iPhone for 600 euros for as long as there are iPhones for 600 euros to be had. If you go to the shop and there's no more iPhones left, then you know, the promise to have an iPhone for 600 euros cannot possibly be honored because there's no iPhones to do that. So to think that you place a stop and it's going to be honored is an illusion that is a very dangerous illusion. As long as there's a market and you get lucky, the stock could be honored. But if the market has jumped, then no, the stocks are not honored. That's exactly the, the whole point of today's presentation. So if you go to, to the Saxo Bank thing, if you read this text carefully, what this is telling you is that, you know, maybe you thought you had a stop at 118 and you were filled at 118. But then they tell you, hey, you know, you know what? Fuck you, there was no market, and excuse my English, there was no market, therefore, you thought your stop was filled at 118, but it wasn't. So, you know, that, that, that's basically, the, the, a broker or a dealer is, a, is as good as their promise, and if they, if they choose not to honor their promise, or if they don't have any money to back their promise, then stops are not honored. That's the risk you run as a trader with a broker or a market maker. Is that clear? So, uh, yeah, do, do most market makers run stops? Well, let me put it this way. When you are trading with a market maker, the market maker is both the, the market in the sense that it's their win or loss, depending on what the price is, and they are the referee in the sense that they, they are the ones who say what the price is. So you could argue as much as you wanted with, say, uh, I'm not saying with, with Saxo Bank in this case, because it's public that Saxo Bank did this, you could tell Saxo Bank saying, hey, I think the market price was 118, but then Saxo Bank would say, no, the price was 102, and that's the end of the story, because they are the ones who decide what the price was, not you. That's what I mean when you trade against a market maker, you're trading both against the market and the referee, because it's the referee who makes the market. Okay, so if you're concerned about... Uh, Well, the, the field is lopsided precisely because of that, because it's a game you can't possibly win. <laughs> that, that's the thing. It's that you're playing a game which is impossible to win. That's, that, that's the whole point. If it's a heads up, you lose, tails, the broker wins or the dealer wins. Precisely because they're the ones who, you know, basically, if they decide it's a penalty, and even if it's a complete ripoff, it, it's them who call the penalty. So if you play against that in a match that's rigged and the referee decides that you know something was a penalty, this is no way that you know you can appeal against it because it's the the last word is the referee's, not yours, and that's why it's lopsided. So yeah, that was pretty much it. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any any questions on this. I, I hope it was uh, useful to you guys. Uh,
so that's essentially what happened. Uh, I, I was actually getting to the last point. Basically, what I was saying is that don't take this as saying that uh, brokers are uh, a bad risk because, for instance, in, in, in the situation when you incentivize customers to trade for the long term, you offer low leverage and you only offer liquid assets for people to trade with, then all of this doesn't really happen in the first place. So for instance, on that, that uh, day, Darwinix, we, we only lost 1% of our capital base, which is essentially peanuts uh, at that point. So don't, don't leave this one thinking that things have to be the way that they run with FXCM. What you should not do is offer customers 1 to 500 uh, leverage because things like this happen. Um, so there's a question on whether Cyprus brokers are honorable. Uh, I mean, I don't think this, it's a question to... So let, let me talk about facts, okay? So basically, the, the facts on, on, on Cyprus. Um, well, I'm pretty sure that Cyprus has a deposit guarantee scheme in place. Uh, however, you should, I think you know that three years ago, Cyprus, the country, went bust. And anyone who had money in a Cypriot a bank, uh, some of that money was taken away from them because the, the country went past. So even if the, the, the Cyprus broker is honorable, you can bet that your money is going to be sitting in a bank in Cyprus. And it's only three years ago that that country went bust. So if you ask me, I think it's a very, very, very stupid risk to be taking when you can choose to trade with an FCA regulated broker to go and trade with a Cyprus regulated one. So, uh, John, I, yeah, I appreciate you're in a, in a down spirit about this one. I, I really don't think you should be discouraged. I mean, you've been hit by a bad situation with Alpari. I must say there's nothing you did wrong with it because uh, how are you supposed to know that someone who's FCA regulated is going to go down like that? Uh, I guess, you know, um, shit happens sometimes, but... But ultimately, you know, you're going to get to, to get your money back, and uh, you're, you're, uh, you've learned a lot in this process. So I would look at it as a as a learning opportunity. Uh, and then, in terms of what safe leverage is, FX Boyki. So uh, I, I'm not a trader, and I'm not someone to tell you. What I can tell you is that I am. You know, we we know who trades with us, and I can tell you that the traders who trade with low leverage are the ones who make the good long-term results. So whenever we see someone who's trading with 100 to 1 leverage, we know that unfortunately that guy has a very, very high chances of blowing up uh, the moment something happens in the market. So if you like your money, I think the clever thing is to trade with low leverage, grow your money consistently, and attract investor capital the way we offer at Darwin X, for instance. Okay. So it sounds like we, so is it better to have smaller accounts at a few brokers? Uh, I, I think, well, depends. So the, 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 the limit is up to 50,000 uh, pounds sterling. So uh, the worst thing that could happen is what happened to John, who put down whatever money he had and uh, Alpari went down and he's still waiting for it. I guess if he had spread his money uh, across several brokers, then uh, this he wouldn't he wouldn't have been hit that badly. So I know for a fact that most of our customers at Darwin X have several brokers. So it seems like uh, customers who've been long in the game do that. Yeah. Also, when you have accounts with several brokers, you can test who's offering you the better service, so you can choose where to send most of your money at any one point in time. Okay. So unless anyone has any more questions, I, I sincerely hope that this helped you understand what it is that happened. And uh, if, you, you know, if you hear of somebody in the forums uh, talking stuff without understanding what it is they, 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 they're talking about, then you know, feel free to recommend this one, because uh, I really hope that whoever watches this one has learned a lesson that uh, will not cost him uh, a lot of money. So happy trading to everybody. And if you have any one-to-one -one questions, So, uh, so there's, there's one last question, which is, why is it better if um, uh, a broker takes a trade with the same trade as the customers? Well, ultimately, it's a question of judgment. So let me put it this way. Uh, if you're trading against customers, 
it's good for you, for customers to lose. And if you're trading with customers, then it's painful for you as a broker to see your customers lose. So, you know, it could be that it doesn't matter, but then all our incentives are for, our, uh, in the case of Darwin X, which is a broker, all our incentives are for customers to win. Because if, we, if customers don't win in the long run, then we lose. So that's the incentives we have. Uh, others make more by having the customers lose than they make by having the, the customers win. And I think that's a very, that's a quite a big difference in the way that you approach your business. And in terms of where Darwin X is uh, situated, so we are uh, located and regulated in the United Kingdom by the Financial Conduct Authority, as you saw earlier in the webinar. Okay, I think we've run over time. I don't want to use up uh, FX Street's courtesy any longer than I already have. So thank you guys so much. Uh, as I said, if you, if you have any questions, uh, my, my email address was written there, and I would be very happy to take those offline. Uh, take care and uh, happy trading.